Okay, good morning. Uh, yesterday we had the Taban strike. Today we have an official visit from the president of Turkey, but I hope you did not encounter too many difficulties in reaching the institute. <laughs> you were here, so yeah, obviously it was not so bad. Um, we, uh, we start uh, our second day of the conference, and as well we start, we begin with the fourth session. Um, and uh, before I pass the floor to uh, our moderator, I would like to introduce to you shortly Professor Uta Podgiser, um, who is architect, professor of building construction and materials at Technische Hochschule Ostwestfalen Lippe, where she is also a member of the Institute of Design Strategies and vice president for culture, communication, and international affairs. Um, since 2018, she's also chair of the program Heritage and Technology at Technical University Delft, um, a program which combines architecture, engineering, and interior architecture. Uh, since 2022, uh, she serves as chair of Docomomo, uh, Docomomo International, and is also editor-in-chief of uh, Docomomo Journal. Uh, she's also a co-founder of the European Facade Network, and of the International and Indisciplinary Master of Integrated Design at Technische Hochschule Ostwestfalen Lippe. In her ac architectural practice and academic research, Professor Uta Podgiser is mostly concerned with protection, reuse, and improvement of the built heritage and environment. In Professor Podgiser's biography, there are many other activities and points uh, uh, and roles that uh, could be listed, but I will stop here and I will pass the floor to our moderator, Professor Uta Podgiser. Uta, the floor is yours. So thank you, Malga Shata, um, for, for introduction and also thank you to the organizers and the Pilecki Institute for inviting me. It's, it's really a great pleasure. I, I see a lot of familiar faces and friends and colleagues uh, from Docomomo, but also beyond Docomomo. So it's, uh, it's really very nice setting to be here. And uh, I also want to say I like the format. I know it's very challenging for the speakers to, uh, to stick to to a 10 minutes presentation, but um, I just repeat it here for the speakers of the session uh, to come. But I think it is very nice because it offers the opportunity to have more speakers presenting and thus to create um, maybe a bigger audience and a bigger exchange um, um, of themes and, and topics. And um, yeah, it's my pleasure to share this session uh, shared heritage points of contact best practices. I know it's always a, a difficult issue to um, discuss the question, what is shared heritage? Uh, I see Edward also in the audience and there is the modern heritage of Africa and there is the shared heritage Africa project, um, which I was also conducting uh, the last uh, two years. Um, uh, financed by the German Foreign Ministry and I, 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 I encountered a lot of uh, challenges in this definition of shared. So I'm curious um, if maybe in this discussion we, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what might be the definitions or the point of views regarding the shared heritage towards the, let's say, um, Eastern European um, 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 aspects that, that will be presented. But I don't want to take too long because we, we would like to, to save our time also for the final discussion. And uh, I will start to um, introduce the first uh, speaker. Um, what we do is, I think this is the format that um, proved to be good uh, yesterday, that we will first have all the f uh, five presentations, one after another, um, a ten minutes ideally um, each, and then we will um, meet here in front uh, for the discussion. So there will be no questions after this, this, uh, the presentation, so keep your questions in mind and uh, we will have all the questions afterwards. So, to start, 
I'm, um, I'm happy to welcome the first speaker, which is already sitting in the first row. Most, uh, row, most of you might have met him, Alex Bikov, who is an architect, an activist, and an active archivist. I think this is how we could uh, um, call him um, from Ukraine and um, um, who is very, was very active in saving a lot of archives personally. Um, and trying to bring them into a more public and accessible and visible place. And his topic is Safe Kiev Activism. Um, Alex, the floor is yours. Please try to stick to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Great pleasure to be here. And it's a great pleasure to start, it, to start today's day. And before uh, my... Uh, presentation will start. I would like to respect uh, all uh, Ukrainian defenders who are recently defending our land and to respect all people who save uh, and evacuate uh, Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage artifacts. So my uh, paper is called Safe Kiev Activism, but uh, I would like to start with a short introduction of uh, of the history of Ukrainian people from the independence time, uh, because you know that uh, after, uh, before uh, the Soviet Union fall, uh, there was a huge uh, human uh, activism to be independent, and there was uh, a chain of uh, human uh, through the whole uh, countries of the post-Soviet uh, territories, and also it was in Ukraine. So uh, this uh, willing and ability people to collect, to express uh, their idea started quite, uh, quite from the first days of independence. And here you see some uh, archive photos uh, of uh, this time. But then uh, also there was a number of strikes uh, and uh, on this photo, you see a famous strike of coal miners uh, from the Donbass region where the war uh, happened. Uh, and um, this uh, was in 1997-1998, uh, and these people walked through the whole uh, territory of Ukraine uh, in a thousand uh, of kilometers from the east to the capital, uh, Kyiv. Uh, express uh, their willing to have uh, much more uh, salary, much more better uh, working condition, and etc. And uh, then uh, happened the first revolution in 2004, which was called uh, Orange Revolution. And then happened uh, in 2013 Dignity Revolution, which was much more uh, wider, had wider scale. And also, it's presented uh, Ukrainian people as a nation which uh, was uh, ready to collect, uh, to express uh, their statement, and uh, to, be, uh, to be willing to fight uh, for their rights. And uh, on this photo, uh, for instance, uh, you see also interesting uh, object uh, that is in between a Stalinist and modernist era during this Dignity Revolution. Uh, and then there was a number of uh, activist protests against uh, uncontrolled development, uh, which happened uh, at the end of the 90s uh, because of different aspects of corruption through the whole vertical of uh, our city council in Kyiv as well as the state uh, generally. And unfortunately, a lot of pieces uh, of land uh, of uh, city sites were sold out for some commercial developers. And one day, they decided uh, to build uh, some ugly skyscrapers or the business center, etc. And on this photo, you see uh, a building that, which was listed as an architectural monument. It's called, it's, it's called uh, Guest Court. Uh, and in this building uh, was situated architectural library, also two scientific institutions, but our president Yanukovych, who escaped from Kyiv during the Dignity Revolution, uh, he uh, occupied this building and um, let all this institution to go away. 
So people started to protest against uh, this uh, action. And uh, then uh, photographer uh, Max Trebuchov uh, took uh, a series of photos of uh, this protest of uh, neighbors against the developer, developers, which happened quite a lot of time uh, through the whole uh, territory of Kyiv. And here you see uh, a number of uh, these pictures when people are fighting against the developer and there's also, uh, let's say, hooligans, uh, gangs, uh, because someday you can see a fence in front of your window where it was a kindergarten place or some uh, park, uh, etc. And people were against this and uh, unfortunately, City Council and Architectural Department was not able uh, to protect this land, so people uh, decided to take uh, their future in uh, their hands. And uh, then it became a, a very massive uh, activism uh, groups, uh, and uh, also it became so weird uh, sometimes. And uh, Max Trebuchov shoot uh, this uh, actions uh, during 12 uh, years. That, this is my favorite picture. I think that golden ratio proportions are also here hidden somewhere. Uh, so, uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, this ten uh, tension uh, catch also a Soviet, so-called Soviet heritage. And on this photo, you can see Institute of Scientific and Economic Information, so-called UFO building or flying saucer building. So one day we saw a news uh, that it will be developed. Uh, and uh, on this side, behind this building, a new and big uh, shopping mall will be built. But uh, the most bizarre uh, thing in this project was that on the left side, already a big, big shopping mall was already built, and it was called Ocean Mall. So they decided to build here much more bigger, which they would like to call uh, a shopping plaza. Uh, and uh, you see this uh, shape in which was uh, invented, firstly, uh, the first idea of an architect, Florian Yuriev, uh, a theater of colors. I will tell you a bit more. Uh, and uh, these photos uh, I took uh, in 2018 uh, in this uh, concert hall before it was partly demolished. And this is uh, the space uh, below uh, this shape. So we saw these pictures and we decided that it's uh, completely wrong, let's say, and we were against uh, this project. So. We made uh, a public event, uh, a, an evening uh, dedicated to Florian Yuryev's uh, heritage, because people uh, already forgot uh, his name, uh, but he was quite famous architect. He was also uh, a violinist master. He was theorist of uh, colors, of music, uh, etc. And he was making these violins by himself. He made a full uh, a string uh, orchestra. Uh, and he was also, he invented his uh, language of uh, colors. Here you see some of these pictures. So he colored uh, music, sounds, words, uh, whatever. And uh, this is uh, archive photos of his er experiments with the theater of color. So idea was that you were sitting uh, in a space, uh, in a shape, and without any sound, you was watching only sequence of changing colors and hear the music in your brains. Uh, and this is some photos of this event. So there was a lot of people came for this happening and it was quite unexpected for us. And uh, we presented his violin, some musicians played on it, and Florian Yuryev also expressed his ideas, his thoughts. He, for example, talked without microphone, but he was 88 years old. So in, in this way, he uh, showed that this shape of the UFO uh, concert hall had an excellent acoustic. And then uh, architects, uh, which we found, were authors of uh, this project. They presented uh, their project, you see, and people were uh, against it. And there was a huge, huge, huge uh, uh, amount of mails, letters, 
from different people uh, all over Kyiv who wanted to help us to protect this building. So we decided to somehow name ourselves and we named Safe Kyiv uh, Modernism. So uh, our uh, main achievement uh, was uh, that we did a several exhibition about Florian Yuriev's heritage here in uh, National uh, Art Museum in uh, Ukraine with all his uh, pictures and all his uh, architectural uh, objects. Uh, uh, this is uh, another exhibition which took place in Warsaw. This is my piece of art uh, also telling the story about uh, this building. And we m made, uh, let's say, uh, a basic or regular architectural project together with Florian Yuriev, how this place uh, can be uh, restored accordingly to author's uh, idea. And you can find uh, this uh, project on the website Safe Kyiv Modernism and download PDF presentation for free. Uh, and then um, uh, the UFO building finally was listed as an architectural monument. Uh, another case is uh, about a bit different project. So uh, UFO building was built in the late 70s and can be named as a modernistic. And this one is more about postmodernism. It called it uh, called Flowers of Ukraine. Uh, and it was built uh, in the late 80s. So one day, uh, also uh, another developer bought uh, this plot and bought this place where was a kind of uh, shop, uh, flowers shop, also with a small laboratory. All Kiev citizens like it uh, very much. Uh, it was kind of uh, glass house uh, interior. Here, uh, original archival uh, drawings by the author Mikola Levchuk, and this is uh, archival photos how it looked like uh, during the 90s, 90s. And also, this grape covered this building, and it was kind of landmark masterpiece. Also, it's very important that UFO building is situated kind of on the outskirts of the city center, but this one is situated particularly in the old town. And uh, a lot of people are passing through it uh, during the whole days, and people really liked this grape and this building. So you can see how it looked like perfectly. But one day, developer bought it and decided to make uh, this uh, ugly renovation. And without any permission, he started to demolish uh, this building. First of all, they cut it, uh, this grape. And then in the middle of the day, like on Monday, uh, I don't remember a particular day, it's a Monday, Tuesday, in the, the 12 a.m., they started to demolish this building with this technique and this sound like, tu, 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 you know, uh, in the middle of the day. So people were just wonder what is going on. Uh, but all the building uh, was also covered with the fence, and people called the police, uh, and it doesn't help. So people decided, again, to broke this fence and to occupy this building. And it's also uh, very important to notion that most of these people are young people generation who want uh, to live in a much more better city environment, to uh, protect their uh, ecological, uh, let's say, urban uh, environment. And uh, they called themselves Flowers of Ukraine. And uh, this is also kind of a chain of uh, an activism because uh, they were inspired uh, by us with Safe Kyiv Modernism. But uh, then they did much more... Uh, better work, I would say, uh, because they did this, uh, their brand style, uh, they have their uh, graphic uh, design, and also you can uh, follow uh, their Facebook and Instagram pages, uh, and you can download also a lot of information about that. Uh, but uh, here it's interesting that a number of courts started against uh, this group uh, from the side of the developer. And unfortunately, one deal uh, they lost, and it is the most important deal of uh, a copyright rights of an architect who is still alive. But the case was that the lawyers of the developers, they choose uh, the law of uh, the rights, uh, not rights by the law, 
of uh, 1985 when the building was built. And according to this statement, all copyrights are connected with the scientific institution. So it's like a huge topic to discuss. But then uh, they won already part of uh, another course. So it's like a number of courts between activists and developers. And on the, li on, on the left, uh, you can see this author, Mikola Levchuk, and he's also very closely uh, linked uh, with this activist group. And then happened another very important uh, happening in Kyiv. Uh, Kviti, uh, Flowers of Ukraine invented this march, uh, march uh, which was called March for Kyiv. And it collected all activists from Kyiv, which were not only about saving uh, architectural heritage, but also about making uh, Kyiv more uh, pedestrian, uh, like free for bicycles, etc. And there was a thousand of people. And uh, I would like to ask you if you know some uh, similar examples from the history of architecture and urban development, where there was such a huge strike for the urban rights. Let's say I will be very grateful for uh, information. And uh, this happened in uh, inspired us with uh, our last project. This is the Ukrainian pavilion in Venice Biennale. And we made uh, this short uh, installation in Giardini Gardens, uh, inspired by this march. We wanted to state uh, one more time this ability and uh, this willing of young people to be responsible for their future, for their future and uh, uh, to be willing to live in their more bright, uh, free, and peaceful future. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alex, for, for again, Im impressive photos and, um, um, yeah, very, very active people-oriented um, activities. Um, we are now moving forward to um, Professor Marcin Lachowski from the University of Warsaw, um, who will talk to us um, about, I have to read it, this is a long title, who will talk to us about the history and utopia of modernism in the narratives of contemporary Polish artists. And I guess it will also be very challenging for him um, as an architectural historian and uh, critic and theorist um, to, uh, to put all his thoughts <laughs> into this kind of comprehensive format. But I guess from activism, we are going to theory. And I'm looking forward to your presentation, Marcin. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. And thank you. I'm happy for the invitation for, for this, on this conference. Um, my speech uh, is slightly, uh, slightly on the margin of main plot of this conference um, concerning architectural uh, history of modernism. Uh, I will be talk about uh, artistic intervention in the meanings of modern architecture. I prepared, I, I, I've prepared uh, a text and uh, to subordinate to the time regime, I uh, will try to uh, read uh, very clearly and, uh, and fast, I think. So, uh, in Polish uh, history of visual arts of the last 30, 30 years, among other models of historical uh, reworking, the interpretation of architectural heritage and spatial arrangements inscribed in the history of modernism has, has gained an important place, significantly demonstrating the need to broaden the pool of themes defined by the development of visual forms themselves. Major exhibition projects such as Concrete Heritage, Ideal City, Invisible Cities, and finally, Warsaw Under Construction evoke the theme of contemporary artist attitude towards the idea of modernity. Often defined by the regional formula of such modernism, 
which was realized in smaller scale architect architectural objects such as shopping pavilions, schools, kiosks, bus stops, and in differentiation of urban settings. The growing interest in the, interest in the uh, 1990s in the project of Jerzy Hrynewiecki, Halina Skibniewska, or last but not least mentioned here, Oskar Hansen became, became an attempt to valorize individual transformations of social modern legacy to discern individual attitudes in the area of racial modernity, constructing a continuity between past times and the social transformation taking place in the 90s. Looking at few selected aspects of interpretation of modernist legacy in art, I would like to trace the strategies of locating modernism in contemporary artistic programs, recalling the diverse range of references marked by the works of Krzysztof Zieliński, Monika Sosnowska, or Diana Lelonek, the work of this artist developed in the first decades of the 21st century consistently invokes the category of modernism as a modernization, as a theme of contemporary art, becoming a bridge between trauma of ideological centralist utopias and the assimilation of social aspiration abandoned during capital transformation. Using different means of expression, they represent different types of imagery, displacing striped down fragments of modern splendor into buildings, blocks of new visual experiences, representing unevenly slow social transformations through architectural fragments, and finally shifting the history of modernity towards large scale non human imaginary. The theme of new positioning, positioning of subject in relation to the past is characteristic of Krzysztof Zieliński's work. As he himself recalled, he returned after his studies in Prague and long stay in Berlin to Wombrzoźno, the, the artist's uh, hometown in northern Poland, was associated with the particular sense of alienation. Where he made his subsequent photographic series, Hometown and Millennium School. Zieliński took the photographs of the eponymous Millennium School during the holiday season, arranging 44 frames into a photo album. Subsequent photographs show empty corridors and halls, a stigmatized school, built according to a plan to celebrate 1,000 years of Polish history, and at the same time responding to a post-war demographic growth, fitting it <coughs> fitting in with the socialist postulate of universal education. Schools built according to standardized plan were intended to meet local needs, functionally adapted for many purposes, such as hospital functions in the event of armed conflict. Zieliński's school is deserted, eliminating the anecdotal nature of the action. The photographer accentuates the multicolored interiors subjected to contemporary first facelift, and the object and furnishing that build compositionally and meaningful relationships. The rigor uh, of the frames of the intense and colors and life enlivened the presence of the object themselves transferred from the past to the present. The photographer employs several fundamental shots, either using a frontal frame to accentuate the static nature of the wall, or breaking the out diagonal lines to introduce a visual effect of uniqueness. However, he has clearly uh, transformed this modernist pattern of grasping images, exposing the engaged position of photographer by carefully, carefully editing the picture, pictorial space and radically separating the position of photographer in relation to the scene depicted. His photographs offer a holistic view, at the same time presenting the relationship be between thing in shared, intense visual space, revealing the complex relationships between them, the way in which he photographs, arranges the scenes, 
and searches, searches for the right lighting reproduces of process constant reorganization of vision, leading, as Michael Fried put it, an impression of complete autonomy and visual absorption of depicted world. The last frame of the album shows the school building from outside, exposing the side wall as a kind of border marking the autonomy of photographic reality. Describing the past, Zieliński's photographs show the sphere of photographic experimentation as a peculiar hallucination and sublimation, as a model replacing the persuasive character of the document with an ambiguity of photographic frame, revealing the internal relation of props which make up individual frame, frames. The schools of millennium, which are peculiar monument of the socialist statehood, in Zieliński's photographic became a peculiar record of mystery, of the uncertainty of getting to know alienated places, portraying the discontinuity of existential experience in the social frame of political transformation of 1990s and 2000s. A different dimension of editing modernity in her work is presented by Monika Sosnowska. For her, to the camera is a special sketchbook, a selection of visual motifs. After her individual work one-to-one -one in 2007 in Polish pavilion in Venice, Venice, the author decided to show her photographs in the catalog of Schaulager Basel exhibition, showing views of Warsaw. The album begins with a photograph of Palace of Culture and Science taken from below, reaching the steel spire of the sky, the next, frame, the next frames were taken from the right bank of Vistula, first showing a distance view of the city center, again with a palace of culture, but in vicinity of glass buildings of modern office blocks. The next frames show blocks of glass framed in a diagonal cut, or finally decaying fragments of post-industrial installations more and more disorderly elements of corroded walkways, foot bridges, and fi finally disorderly heaps being the effect of disintegration of modern factory structures. The narrative proposed by, by Sosnowska shows a particular moment of symbolic transition from a monument of communist power through its absorption by global capital, resulting on in simultaneous decay of the old obsolete economic structures and progressive suburban degradation. Distort deformed industrial material uh, is also the building block of Sosnowska large scale realizations. Since exhibition and overscaled steel structure that visually burns the interior in the pavilion in Venice, the artist has gradually moved away from the earlier labyrinthian arrangements that made up her earlier interiors towards gigantic open world structure that invoke the devastated language of modernist architecture. When realizing her installation tower in New York, the artist used a giant steel structure of window frames when compressed, exposed horizontally. The work, as Andrzej Turowski pointed out, referred to the model of modernism, Chicago skyscrapers, skyscrapers, defining the reality of urban center of Warsaw after 2000. The gigantic structure can also be seen as a model of devastation of constructivist utopias embodied in the idea of collecting, co co collective construction and communication which had exhausted the potentially the face of collapse of totalitarian history and the utopia of accompanied, accompanied them. By deconstructing the vertical layout of tower, the horizontal forms simultaneously introduced uh, uh, the possibility of feeling a uh, post-Soviet reality devoid a base, feeling the void with a branching passage. A particular variant of Sosnowska open work structure was a representation of facade at the Lubin's Labyrinth Gallery. 
a work previously exhibited among others in the Melbourne and Dubai, weighing more than a ton and measuring over seven meters, the structure was made from a copy of steel facade. Deformed into a conical shape, the form was suspended from the gallery's vault, creating an upper work, delicate sculptural form in the empty space. The suspension of the object defined its other dimension, re replacing the horizontal rhizomatic layout of New York realization with a visually gravity breaking layout that balanced the per permanence of material with an ephemeral nature of open work sculpture. Sosnowska was, work was presented in a specific concert, context, a gallery building located in the halls of former communist era care repair shop, adapted even as legend has it to repair, for repairing tanks. The hall-like vaulted space associated with the history of mechani mechanical industry, replaced in the 2000 by the art industry, inscribed the structure into a particular interpretation of a place displacing traces of the past and at the same time redefining the meaning of contemporary art associated with abandoning traditional forms and stimulating social and artistic activism. The heavy structure excavated from the modernist facet resembled a pendulum showing the course of time looped through the structure. The exhibition was accompanied by, the, by performance by dancers reinforcing the mobile structure of Sosnowska object, dismantling the framework of the past towards new social possibilities. In other respects, an industrialized landscape of Upper Silesia uh, this time became a tool for the affirmative, uh, affirmative native, native conductive, uh, narrative conducted by Diana Lenonek. In a series of photographs, one of which a quiet, a particular monumental character, we observe a landscape stretching to a horizon enclosed by a buildings of huge structures of Katowice steelworks in Dombrowa Gurnica, the leading project of the 1970s in the era of Gierek, which highlights, as if by chance, framed naked figure, figures moving towards the left edge of the photography shown on grown natural terrain. The Lonex work continually explores the boundaries between natural developing organisms and their cultural settings. Which is next photos from this series. The photograph in question shows a human, human heart inscribed in natural landscape revealing uh, the ambiguous status of human and non-human beings devoid of individualization against the backdrop of industrial megastructure that grows out of natural ground. The artist uses the suffix nature culture, this, mm, sorry, it is next uh, examples of such a, a artistic expression. Nature culture to describe her work, which accentuates the leveling of dichotomy of human creations set against the natural landscape. It is pas passionate as if haphazard manner of framing. brings together in the quasi-documentary language of photographic uh, communist industrial complex with the pre civilizational stage of human non-human beings. The artist reached out uh, to describe a place close to her, which is inscribed on a huge time scale, showing the coexistence of indi industrial complex and primordial communities that made up, that made up the human animal herds. The artist's use of theme of industrialized landscape, characteristic of functioning of People's Republic of Poland, and landscape based on the gigantic process of natural resources, is not so much subjected to catastrophic criticism as to mark a place where the confrontation and symbiosis of culture and subjectivity with inhuman elements producing 
a dense network of dependencies takes place. The recognition of landscapes of Dobrowa Gornicza is not an expression of rejection of unwanted past, but reinforces the experience of timeless continuity, expre continuity expressed in the components of a post-humanist interpretation. The examples presented some and many others um, reveal the placement of new legacy, uh, legacy of the People's Republic of Poland, the ongoing dispute <coughs> around a distance, distanced view of that culture. They transform the generalized, generalized discourse of history uh, in a, into a specific place created by a singular narrative. Place, as Tim Cresswell proclaims, is a meaning, meaningful location. It has a concrete form and is located somewhere and is char characterized by meanings given both individually and collectively. Space, on the other hand, is an, an abstract uh, concept. To transform space into place is to make a natural location similar to many others into unique uh, image. Many works evoking the landscape of People's Republic of Poland, artists biograph biographically linked to the times of systematic transformation, were at the same time part of revisionary and political models describing the complex relationships between the past and the present, which made up diverse range of proposals. From a clear demarcation of the broader dissociation from a socialist past in a right-wing formula to patterns of assimilation, emphasizing continuity manifest in various manifestations of everyday life. This area of debate stretched over a decade and renewed from time to time became the context for visual assimilation of the formulas of social modern architecture. Such a return, nostalgic to a certain extent, describing the situation of artists starting out in the 1990s and looking back with curiosity. But they were complemented, complemented by another dimension of extracting tools from the past that would adequately express both resistance to instrumentalization and mercantilization of common space, but also find visual expression, expression describing the future as a new nexus of relationships, annexing industrial megastructures and separate entities into new complex manifestation, manifestations of life. Signifying another way of meditating of emptiness on ruins of history in new interpretations of time for which, for which modernism is a place, one model for describing the change that is taking place, the apocalyptic vision of the composition of history, history is in various ways replaced by a vision of micro-utopia as a matrix of contemporary meanings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcin, for this uh, presentation. Beautiful images, different from the first presentation. I'm, I'm curious already about the discussion um, afterwards. Um, now we, we welcome a photographer, Louis Volkmann, who was announced to present together with Ben Carden, who unfortunately is uh, sick today. Um, Louis uh, himself is a photographer who studied in Leipzig and a filmmaker. And he is talking about, isn't the new post office beautiful? So about um, the um, picture postcards as a visual textual testimonies. And uh, as I understood, the focus is uh, on East Germany, uh, East German modernism. So, Louis, please. Um, it's okay, yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me here and us, dziękuję za inwitację, because I studied in Wrocław also, I can speak a little bit Polish. Uh, vielen Dank für die Einladung. Um, I will read some of the uh, foils. 
because Ben is not here today. Um, when did you write a postcard last time? Maybe it's some time ago. And uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking about a time where postcards, especially in East Germany, were the mass medium number one. And there's a simple reason for that, because there were not much private phones in the households. So people were writing a ton of postcards every year. You cannot imagine how many postcards were produced every year in former East Germany. This is a very representative postcard of the 60s. It shows the new main post office of Chemnitz, former Karl Marx Stadt. And it's uh, quite a nice picture. You have, um, at that time, modern cars. You have this uh, blue sky, some people on it, and uh, a completely new building. And this is in the very center in the former old town of Chemnitz. And from the same architect collective, uh, Kurt Novotny is his name. Uh, on the right side, you see also a main post office building from the year it was um, realized, from 1964. And uh, for the architects among you, this is one of the first buildings with aluminum glass facade in the, uh, East Germany. And it's uh, still there. It's OK renovated, let's call it like this. And I did a huge work, like photographic series and also a documentary movie about this building. And uh, I have um, among 30 postcards of that building. And I will go into detail later. And to show you just one example, I will read this to you uh, so you can get an impression of the many facades of a postcard. There's the back side, and it uh, shows uh, everyday life in East Germany. My dear Hertha and Hermann, I landed safely with my large luggage on Saturday and I was taken out of the compartment by six men. Lieselotte is happy that she can now sue, her, sue to her heart's content. Please be so kind as to get a pair of dark blue tracksuit trousers from Neckermann, which was a mail order, in size 132, a simple one to go with the old blouse and sent them as an express parcel with fruit in advance, and then, in a few days, the first half pound of coffee and fruit again. The post now takes a long time. Parcel from 10th June hasn't arrived yet, neither has the express parcel from 14th June, while an express parcel arrived the other day. The weather is summery. The train was overcrowded in second class, the ales were already full from Hanover. I can't read it. I had a first class ticket and was alone in the compartment with a couple as far as Leipzig. Many thanks and greetings from your Betty. And the last sentence, isn't the main new post office beautiful? Which is a rare find because normally people don't refer to what's on the front side. It's uh, very few. Uh, cases that people are writing on what's on the front side of the postcard. So, and this, that would be Ben's part. Um, our thesis is archives and archival practices play a central role in the construction of truth, meaning, and interpretation. That's nothing new to us. Uh, everyone who's working with archives know that. They do so, for example, by collecting... Oh, oh, sorry, I'm... Uh, between here, by collecting, preserving, cataloging, and making, keeping accessible cultural artifacts and social traces. Archives are instruments to control or govern knowledge and cultural or social memory. They are char characterized by an inherent tension between, on the one side, the construction, creation, our generation, or of course the documentation. Every archive is documenting something. Archives are inherently selective. Uh, 
unlike stamp collections, uh, where the word would be philately, in German we say uh, philocartie, or uh, in English it is deltiology or social deltiology. For example, postcard collections are almost in inevitably contingent. This is due to the history and the forms of production and use of the medium. Private collections additionally have a personal approach and selection and also depend on the availability of collectible material and means for collection. From a cultural heritage perspective, those collections can be regarded as supplementary archives or even counter archives, depending on the perspective. And as as far as we know, and we are doing this research for quite some years, there is no official representative or even complete reference collection for postcards. There are archives of uh, publishing houses, there are private archives, but it's all very limited and subjective. And um, traditionally, private collections of picture postcards were rarely publicly accessible, less even reusable because they were analog. You could only see them as a 10 by 15 centimeter um, paper, and you could exchange them. There are some few books about postcards, mostly historical postcards, <coughs> not modern postcards. And uh, collections were mostly restricted to small circles, occasional books, or just the individuals collecting them. Digital media and above all, social media changed that. And uh, apparently we are <coughs> two persons who are doing this. This is the Tumblr website of Ben Carden, um, where he copies all the files he ha already has on Instagram. He puts it on Tumblr because uh, Instagram is quite bad for researching and refining uh, files. You can only search one hashtag on Instagram. You cannot just combine, for example, the word Berlin and Karl Marx Allee and uh, Kino International. You cannot do that. And if there are 10,000 pictures of Kino International, it's hard to find your own postcard if you need an information. <coughs> This is the, yeah, uh, the, 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 our practice is uh, we find these postcards on flea markets, on eBay, wherever you imagine. My, sometimes we get them um, by private persons. We are scanning them in a minimum of like 300 DPI and uh, like 30 centimeters the long side. Uh, we are indexing them. So we are writing everything down from the backside, even this long uh, print run number, which is a nice detail on East German print documents. Uh, every document on uh, East German printing, even it was the, just the etiquette on the beer bottle, it has this print number because it has to go through a little censorship. And that, that's why we can say, from what year is everything what was printed in East Germany. That's something very helpful. Uh, we are displaying them on Instagram, so we are showing them and sharing them with a community which is growing and growing. And sometimes we are getting useful information for people because they say, yeah, the school, I was in the school and it, now it's torn down, by, but I know the architect or but I know the artist from the mural on the school. And um, we are asking ourselves, what's the future? Is it a real archive? Because it's just a digital showcase. And the uh, inherent logic of social media in combination with this deltiological culture gives <coughs> rise to a specific method of assessing and presenting the medium postcard. There's different layers. There's many layers of a postcard. There's the motifs shown, the social use, the transmitted messages, as well as personal and postal traces. And Ben, uh, he already wrote some texts about these topics if you want to go further. However, so far the motif or image matters almost exclusively in digital deltiology. So just to show you that we are not the uh, only ones, uh, there's another 
person who was collecting for a long time called Ostmoderne Philokratie. And that's my channel. It's called Karten der Moderne, Postcards of Modernism. I also show postcards from Czech, Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland from time to time because I went there with my parents in the 80s. And uh, I'm doing this since three, three and a half years now, and there's 12,000 followers, so there should be some interest, I guess. And I will show you at, uh, three short examples why I'm fascinated by picture postcards. Firstly, um, lots of postcards, they are real photographs. So you can scan them and enlarge them and zoom in because they don't have this uh, limitation of the, the offset printing method. You know, this grid where you just, when you zoom in, you only see the, the colorful dots. Um, and this is uh, a picture from Hoyerswerda, one of the three planned cities uh, after Eisenhüttenstadt and uh, later there was Schwedt. Uh, it's an architectural photograph, but also for me it's street photography because you have these persons in the front. Even one person is looking into the eye of the photographer and is uh, beholding us decades after we look at this postcard. It's, you can see that it's summer apparently, it's very hot, and maybe it's Sunday and somebody is washing his car. So there's lots of layers in this picture. Uh, this is from my hometown, uh, Gera, which is one hour south of Leipzig. And everyone, everything you see on this picture, except this old buildings here, it's gone. Um, and on these benches here in the front, I was sitting and waiting for the bus in the 90s when, to go home from school. Um, and yeah, it was exceptional buildings. There was yeah, no building like this. Uh, in other towns, but they erased it because now, of course, there's a shopping center. Uh, so it has um, also biographical means because I, uh, why I collect postcards. And a third one is that I, I find these hidden gems. This is a school from a very interesting architect called uh, Helmut Trauzettel. And, um, I don't know if this mural and the school is still there, but we have the photo. And with the photo, we have a trace. And with this trace, I can go find, uh, look for the artist or architect who built this. Because um, knowledge about East Germany, it's quite hidden. It's quite forgotten. You, you cannot find it easily in the internet. Um, I have to look, go through many books to find the artist of this mural, because it's just not so well documented. It's, it was just not important and it's forgotten. Um, so. um, there are three levels. Uh, if we show it in the internet, there's affirmation, so people just enjoy the pictures, they like it, they comment it, they click it. Secondly, there's interpretation and contextualization. Sometimes people write us comments and give us helpful information. So we are using this swarm intelligence. And thirdly, there's a discursive opening and recontextualization. So sometimes we are invited to give presentations about a special topic like Karl Marx Allee or like um, mass housing estates or whatsoever, because we have this rich archive of together, I would say 10,000 postcards and we can you know, easily group it uh, again to another topic. Plus, um, we are questioning ourselves, okay, it has to be usable in future, and has to be preserved and available, and there's a need to develop archival standards and strategies for the physical collections and, uh, sorry, digital representations. Okay, this is the last text. Um, concluding, um, we want to find and establish an appropriate form and a dialectical discourse 
beyond just showcasing because you know Instagram is not a place for very deep discussions and um, you know content. And um, there's occasional books, blog posts, research, and journal articles, but very less, if any, systematic and sustainable discourse and community. Digital as well as scholarly approaches are very scattered around. Our aim is to have a productive way of utilizing the material in order to unlock the potentials, and there are many potentials, I think, of the medium picture postcard and its social uses for memory work, for example, and social analysis, but also for architecture archives. So sometimes now I get requests by persons who are writing, for example, a PhD about uh, school buildings in East Germany, and um, they are happy to get a good scan from me for their work. Um, and for instance, understanding practices of depicting and engaging with built modernism and how those images influence current perceptions and interpretations. And as we are in the Polish Institute, I am showing you a postcard from 1970 from a famous photographer Stefan Arczynski um, of the new housing estate um, Gajowice in Wrocław. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, write a postcard sometime. <laughs> And I, I also make uh, books, and I, have, I will display it over there. I have uh, postcards and stuff you can get for free. And this is a book about the culture house in my hometown. Thank you. So. Thank, you. Thank you so much, um, Luis. I, I learned a no, new word. I didn't know Delteology, I have to admit. And um, it, I think it is uh, also touching very much upon a, a discussion that we have in Docomomo, not only within Docomomo, I guess many institutions, um, um, academic or non-academic, are, are touching upon the points that uh, you were mentioning about uh, the, the collective memory, how to document, how to archive. Um, so I think a, a very interesting input um, for our discussion. Thank you. Um, we are moving forward and um, I uh, welcome um, Julia Julia Bojarin, I hope I pronounced it correctly, who is representing the Stiftung uh, Villa Schminke. So we stay in, let's say, former East Germany. No, please come here, Julia. And um, who is um, talking about um, an, yeah, an experiment or an initiative that uh, the foundation Haus Schminke is doing, the Topo Momo. And um, I'm very curious because I missed the presentation of Julia that she gave for Dokumomo Germany. So this is the short version today. Thank you very much for being here. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Would you start the timer, please? Yes. I'll try <laughs> really hard. So, so this is uh, me at my workplace, which is obviously really nice. And that is inside this house. This is the house Schminke by Hans Scharun in Löbau, built in 1933. That is where I work, and that's where the project Topumumu actually started. So it's a great house. You can, it's more like an uh, architectural museum today. You can tour it with a multimedia guide. You can have guided tours. You can actually spend the night and uh, make yourselves at home for one night and check out what that feels like. You can have uh, seminars and whatever. And uh, all of that is really, really great and looks fantastic, but... That's where the house is located. So when you look at Germany or you look at Saxony, that is not um, really central. But um, we're in a very rural area, and so we started to look around for other places kind of like us. And if you, if you ever heard about Upper Lusatia before, that is the region where we're at, you might, uh, might probably imagine it like this, but... Upper Lusatia actually looked a lot like this in the 20s and 30s. So um, it was a very strong industrial region. And uh, yeah, as I said, we started to look around for other places that are kind of like uh, the House Schminke. And we did a first Topomomo project um, in 2014. That was more like a touristy project, finding um, buildings on the German, uh, Saxon, and the Czech side uh, that you can visit. 
And we did a book called The Modern View for the Bauhaus Centennial, that is 20 Buildings of Modernism in Saxony. And so we started to find uh, quite a lot of things, uh, which was uh, a little surprising because it's such a rural area. And the reason for that is this used to be a very, very strong industrial region. You can see that um, gray spot uh, at the region that we're talking about. And uh, this strong industrial region um, was full of um, thinking big, belief in progress, belief in the future, and there was a lot of money. And those are things that you need for that kind of architecture. So um, we started to look at that region uh, I'm talking about, and uh, of course those schools kind of came to mind that played a big, big role um, in the education of architects. And uh, when you look at the location of those schools, you're finding out, well, the area that we are looking at and that I'm talking about is really in between those schools. There were other schools and more schools kind of like that, but for our region, this is really interesting, and those schools had quite different approaches uh, on, not on the education, but on the design process for architecture. And so we're, we're trying to find out with the project, well, maybe in between those schools, it is actually an area of experimenting, because there were so many different influences from, um, for example, those schools. There's other influences too, but that's uh, how the name Experimentierland came uh, to life. So this is the Experimentierland. We made a book. I have it right here. Um, we did, uh, we found 30 places, 15 Saxon and 15 Czech buildings that we researched and published in that book. You can see those little pictures on the right side. That's a postcard, actually. And um, all those buildings, every single one of them, has some kind of story that is talking about thinking very big, being uh, yeah, believing in the future, being very, very um, optimistic, and uh, for some part, crazy too. So that's a quick overview. If you, uh, as you can see in that picture, a lot of those uh, buildings are actually empty today and not in the best state. So this project is about finding out the potential of those buildings and then trying to find ways of keeping them and uh, restoring them and making them accessible again. Um, I'll show you a couple of them really quickly, just some pictures. There's industrial places that were very modern because they're very innovative. That is right next to the Haus Schmincke, but they're empty today. A former pasta factory. This is in Zittau. Um, they were very good at, um, they, they invented like new motorcycles, bikes and cars, very innovative back then. This is in a very bad shape as you can see. Uh, there's a lot of trees uh, on the upper floor. Um, we have the Batya store in Ustinad Labem. There's a lot of Batya stores, and they're all architecturally very interesting. But this one, as you can see, the windows, windows are new. It wasn't really restored in the best way, but it's empty too today. And the Batya sign on the top of the building is actually missing, which is really sad. And this is a tower in Vratislavica which belonged to a carpet factory that did huge carpets. They actually did one for the uh, world of Astoria in New York. So those are connections that tell you, well, they were thinking big. Um, then there's places that are still in use. For this part, this is still a textile factory with a really, really cool owner who's trying to support this and bring this forward and keeping up the tradition. It's a great building. Um, or the Kino Warsawa, a movie theater in Liberec, which uh, fell empty, but it found uh, that there were a lot of young people who actually um, saved that from demolition and from uh, falling apart. And they, they are done with the foyer now. It's a really, really nice place. They're working on the movie theater itself. You can actually watch movies there, but they're still working on it. So those are examples that are still having their, their original use. And uh, then there's examples of this uh, former petrol station in Chemnitz, for example. Uh, this will have a completely new use. This is supposed to be the smallest uh, Airbnb in Saxony. Uh, and it's supposed to open uh, for 2025 when um, Chemnitz is gonna be the cultural heritage. 
uh, city. Um, those were all industrial technical buildings in a way, but there's also buildings that uh, met a social need. This is a sanatorium for miners and their families and uh, in Toxi in Czechia, and it's uh, really interesting because for everyone to uh, find the most relaxation and the best holidays, uh, parents and their kids were actually separated there. You can see it on the terrace on the right, that's the terrace for the parents, and on the left, that's the uh, terrace for the kids. And this is uh, the first recreational home for young people that needed to work when they're like 14. So um, this is a recreational home in Zipnitz that is in a very, very bad shape, but it's um, the first recreational home in Saxony, and it's really cool because it went through a lot of political changes uh, in its history. So all of that is a sign for um, this innovation as a motor. This is a textile factory that shows that people were building really fast. They poured concrete on the upper floors and started production on the ground floor already. Um, they had women as clients. This is a movie theater that was um, built by uh, Grete Friedrich in Asch. And uh, they were thinking big and thinking about expansion. This is a, a factory for socks, and uh, you can't see it from this side, but when you look at the back side, you can see the facade on the back side was ready to be expanded. Like, put the same building next to it, and uh, you have the double size. Um, so those are only a couple of examples. There's a lot more. It's a wide ver variety, actually, in that area. And we were thinking, well, if we're finding so much and we're finding so many similarities, maybe there is a shared heritage there. We have a lot of connections between Saxony and northern Bohemia. There was a lot of exchange back then in the 20s and 30s. And if this is actually a shared uh, cultural heritage, well, what are we going to do about it then? What are we going to do with it? Um, we are um, opening a field of research. We're not a research facility. So I'm, uh, we're, we're looking at the moment for, for partners that will help us with this. But we're finding a couple of influences that we think were important for um, the exchange and that shared cultural heritage. And the first thing is the education. Um, all of those art schools and architectural schools, they were mod modernized at that time. They tried to find new ways of education. And the architects themselves, of course, have a lot of connections between each other. They um, uh, have their origins and their experiences. So those are really important to look at. Uh, then we looked at the Werkbund, that German association, because there was also a Czechoslovak Werkbund. And because the because history is complicated, there was also a Werkbund of Germans in Czechoslovakia. So quite an interesting field. And uh, last but not least, there were several avant-garde groups that were really um, trying to exchange ideas across the border very much. So there's only a couple. There's probably a lot more. But as I said, we're at the beginning of some uh, bigger research that I think would be very fulfilling and very, very important. And so looking at those places, we're finding out, OK, this is not really this universal modernism of, of big cities, because we don't really have big cities in that area. But we're finding uh, the question, maybe there is a regional modernism. Maybe there is an adaptive modernism that is trying to adapt to its surroundings. And uh, building traditions, they are influenced by materials and weather and climate and, uh, and needs. But we're finding, on the German and the Czech side, we're finding examples where modernism is trying to adapt to its surroundings, its uh, neighboring houses, its traditions. Uh, right here, this is uh, an old factory, which is today a school, or this wonderful spa in Ustinat Laban, which has the perfect view, and this is actually a postcard, <laughs> Wonderful view of uh, the surroundings behind that spa. That's where the uh, terrace of the spa was. But uh, if you look the other way, you have this huge industrial complex. Um, so we have those three things that we really need to do. The first thing is talk about it. That's what I'm doing right now. We need more awareness for those buildings. And we need strategies to develop those places and save them. And we need a network between those people. 
So talking about it, I was talking about the book, but we also have a little Instagram challenge that just started where you're taking pictures and you can get a little goodie. Um, we uh, did a big con festival um, last year to develop strategies with different experts. And we started working on the network this year with another con festival and trying to get those people together. And if we get that network that is not only concerning owners, but it's also tenants or experts or architects or event managers or whatever, if we get that Topomomo network to work, then we're starting to take care of that uh, shared cultural heritage together because that is the only way that this is going to work. And uh, I'm very, very convinced that some of that innovation and progress and belief in the future is still encapsulated in that architecture in those buildings. And if we find a chance to revive those buildings, I think we'll be able to not look at the left picture, but we'll see the right picture again quite soon. Thank you. I brought a couple of those books. They're in German and Czech only. So if you're interesting, interested, um, come talk to me. <laughs> and I'll see if I still have one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for this um, encouraging um, um, uh, presentation. And uh, um, I'm really, uh, really very inspiring um, ideas that you are presenting. So we come to our final presentation for this session. Um, and it is uh, Daniel uh, Kovac from the Hungarian Museum of Architecture and the, the uh, Hungarian Contemporary Architecture Center and uh, uh, who always has a new topic. Uh, apparently, they also do a lot of interesting work. And today, uh, you are talking about um, women in architecture. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Unfortunately, I missed yesterday, because we, we have just opened uh, an exhibition on Wednesday evening. I only arrived yesterday uh, in the afternoon, but I'm very much looking forward to this day. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a 10 slide presentation. I'm, I'm, I will try to keep with the time. Uh, but there is actually, yeah. yeah. Um, so when I was thinking on what to bring up to, uh, to this conference as a, as a conversation piece, I realized that there is a connection between two topics that keep me occupied nowadays. And one of them is a research project that I'm currently involved with about uh, women in Hungarian architecture, and the other one is a, is a phenomenon that, that's happening in, in Budapest and is about um, the historical recon reconstructions which are taking place uh, in the city. Uh, yeah, first about the, the research project. This is uh, called in Hungarian Magyar Epite Snuk, which literally translates as Hungarian architect women. Now, in Hungarian, as it is in German, there is a word for, for women architects, architectinnen. Uh, if, uh, and it, it happens if we write the last two words together. But uh, as we talk to several important proponents, uh, important actors of this field, uh, some of them were against using this word because they said they are not female architects, they are architects. And we decided to, to skip this word. And by this, uh, this phrase, the title of the project means women who are architects and who are Hungarians. And this is still not the whole picture, and that's one of the topics I'm going to talk about today, because this is still, it still looks quite exclusive. And one of the aims with this project is to be more, a little more inclusive uh, when we look at the history of Hungarian architecture. Because uh, if you imagine what an architect is, usually this is the image that comes to your mind. Uh, the, architect, the architect is, of course, handsome, confident, um, you see? young, with a lot of facial hair, uh, or somewhat less facial hair in some cases. But anyway, it's usually a man who is constructing a building with some designs and plans in his hand. And the research which, which we are doing with, with the Magyar Epitisnök Hungarian architect women uh, proved that this whole way of thinking is completely wrong. There is another kind of architecture which exists 
quite separately, I, I have to say. It's, it's like it's, it is in a different room, but there is a huge amount of achievements, buildings, ideas, networks, a huge web of architecture which is there, is just hidden behind this surface which we have seen in the previous picture. And this led us to think about how we could reevaluate how we talk about architecture, what architecture actually is, and what an architect actually does. Uh, and as I'm thinking about this a lot nowadays, this, uh, the pre preparing to this conference led me to realize that this would also help me with another topic that keeps me occupied, which is the wave of historical reconstructions which is now happening in, in Budapest. You might have heard or might have seen if you've been to Budapest recently that the government started a big scale reconstruction project titled the National Hausmann Program. Uh, which the, the name comes from the original architect Hausmann Alayos of the Royal Castle in Buda. And the major goal of this project is to reconstruct, to reinstall the former royal castle of Buda to its pre-war state, because the castle itself uh, was uh, reconstructed from the 1950s till the 1980s, and now it houses different public institutions. So it's basically one of our most beautiful socialist modernist buildings, despite the fact that it appears to be a royal castle from the outside. But the project not only includes the reconstruction of the castle, but also involves some projects around it in the former, uh, uh, or in the medieval city center of Budapest, in the castle of Buda, the castle district. And this unfortunately also includes some buildings that are there right now, or were there right now, because uh, the project, the National Houseman Program, includes the reconstruction of a few buildings to their pre-war state. These are either partial reconstructions or complete reconstructions, and these sometimes involve the demolition of existing actual values which are now there, post-war buildings, such as this one, designed by uh, Janos Jörg, who was a huge master in post-war Hungarian architecture, and it's, he's widely respected. Or this one, which I've talked about in Zurich a couple of weeks, weeks ago, uh, the National Power Dispatch Center by Virak Csaba, which was designed in the 1970s and finished in 1979. And in my opinion, it's probably the finest example of, of high-tech architecture in Hungary, or was, because both of these buildings that you have just seen are now demolished and unfortunately are going to be replaced with historical buildings, which look like they were erected 100 years ago. Now, to, to, just to make a statement, I'm not necessarily against historical reconstructions myself, I think that can be a valid tool to be used for architecture in certain uh, cases. I always loved how architecture is able to evoke uh, the sense of illusion, for example. I think, I think it's a great way to use uh, architecture. But what I'm against, it, against is that uh, these uh, things happen usually without any involvement of the public. So there are absolutely no public discussions about what's happening in the castle. And as you have seen, they include the destruction of actual existing values. Um, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, the research uh, about women in Hungarian architecture led us to ask a few questions. Uh, this is the slide where I show you the 24 women who are going to be part of the exhibition, which hopefully is going to take place in about a year in Budapest. Quite obviously, the exhibition and the whole idea itself comes from the Frau Architect exhibition in the German Architectural Museum in Frankfurt, which I was able, uh, lucky to see in 2017, and that's where, I, where my interest in this topic originates from, actually. And I know that there are people here who have done much more uh, in this field of, of research than I will ever do, but I we will try to bring up uh, Hungarian architects also to that level where, for example, Czech or German architects are now. Um, so despite this being only one slide, it actually represents years of research. And I, I couldn't have made this slide like a year before because we actually we didn't know about some of the participants, some of the, the figures that you see here on the picture, or we didn't know the data of their life and so on. And there are still, you see, wide gaps or, or gaps actually in, in the research that we have to fill. 
So these are the supposedly Hungarian architects that we are talking about, but if we look at the deeper picture, then we realize that, for example, uh, five of these uh, people who we see in the picture were either not born in Hungary or had a different citizenship during, during their lifetime. For example, Paulus Erika, who was uh, the first uh, woman in Hungary to design and construct buildings after she received her master uh, builder uh, uh, exam in 1900, uh, was born in Switzerland. Uh, she, she was a, a Swiss citizen. Uh, she was born in a family of Transylvanian Germans who worked there, and the later they moved back to Transylvania, and she lived there. She learned Hungarian, of course. She did the exam in Hungarian uh, 123 years ago, um, but she was a German, and she lived in Transylvania, and she remained in Transylvania after 1920 when she became a Romanian citizen. So at least three different states could claim her to be theirs. Also, Esther Pecci, the first uh, structural engineer, uh, the first female structural engineer of Hungary, she, in, in a later phase of her, her life, she moved to the US and became a citizen. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Holo Eva, she immigrated in 1956. She lives in Canada now. Her archives are in the, in the CCA in Montreal. Hopefully, I will be able to talk to her in a couple of days via Zoom, of course, but in English. Uh, I could also mention that the first Estonian woman architect, Paula Ilves uh, de Lascheri, uh, she graduated in the, in the Technological University in Budapest, and she lived in Budapest for a couple of years. She's also part of this research, and I just got in touch with the family, which also led to my very first letter written in Estonian uh, in my life, thanks to artificial intelligence. So uh, by Hungarian, we, we want to create like an inclusive word. I know this, this might sound strange in this context, but we want to, people to understand that it doesn't necessarily mean that these people were either talking in Hungarian or had a Hungarian citizenship. They were part of the Hungarian architectural scene. And we also had to question the meaning of the word architect because as I mentioned, when you think about an architect, you think about somebody who creates buildings. But actually, most of these people that we see on the picture did not necessarily create buildings, but instead created writings, created articles, gave lectures, worked in monuments protection, worked in landscape architecture, worked in interior design. And of course, there are different factors because of which they chose these ways, or they were forced to work in these fields. We acknowledge that, but still, this means that still they are part of, of Hungarian architectural history. And by showing this, we want to build up a more inclusive architectural history. But to do that, we need to find new ways to tell these stories and actually new definitions for architecture, new definitions for what it, it means to be an architect, what an architect does, and what architecture is. And this way of thinking, I think, might help us to, to talk easier about also the other thing that I have shown, the destruction of, of our modern heritage. Because if we try to see that as part of a bigger picture, as, as part of a, of a more holistic view on architecture, then it might be easier to make people understand why these buildings are, are valuable, uh, these buildings in many cases, should remain uh, where they are, even if they don't look great. Just one example uh, how this could work, in my opinion. I, I very much liked Professor Morawanski's uh, sentence last, uh, last evening when he excused himself for being personal uh, here, here in this chair. Because we don't really do that, right? One of the first things that I've learned in the art history department in Budapest is what, what one professor Maroshi told us that an art historian never uses the word beautiful uh, because it's subjective. And I thought he was right, and I, I was in this belief for 20 years. And now, thanks to this research, I'm learning that from time to time it's very important to be personal, to be relatable, because it's so much easier to make people understand why these people and why the, their achievements are important, because they were in this specific situations where their personal experiences and their, their 
social uh, situations defined who they are and what they do. Uh, and making these cases relatable helps us a lot to talk about architecture and architects. Uh, sorry, I'm going to the different direction. That's it, thank you very much. I think it's, yeah, no, it's on. So thank you so much, um, Daniel. And um, I have to say it's very interesting, the, the, uh, the, the details of the Hungarian language, which I don't know, but uh, this discussion about how to use a gender language. And um, I also wasn't here yesterday. I had another conference in, in Detmold on, on facades. And I have to say we had a women's session. And actually, it was a session of three of our former female students who were invited and who are all now in interesting positions and we thought to call that women in engineering and they were completely upset and they really I mean um, um, and there I feel also were kind of age distance because I'm still in this feeling of no we we should name it that there is an issue but um, they really refused that and said no we are we are engineers and we want to present our innovations and whatever so interesting interesting discussion all the speakers are already here and um, I just uh, want to use um, my role as a moderator to maybe give some keywords that uh, that came across um, my um, let's say my mind um, for the discussion. But then I open the floor. Um, so when we talk about this shared heritage and point of context best practices, um, we I, I saw this um, input um, that was given by by Louis and Ben actually about the construction of truth. What is I don't know, the, the context, the, the social memory we create, but also the social role of architecture that was just mentioned um, by uh, Daniel in this last presentation. So what are these um, photographies, these artworks, these initiatives and activism? Wh why are we doing that? And, and what is also their function in a way? On the other side, we can see the, the question of shared heritage um, about with whom um, and what do we share. Um, uh, so we share it with the, the local people on site. Uh, we share it with the larger, uh, I don't know, expert community nationally, internationally. Um, we share it with the community um, for practice, so because we want to, I don't know, rebuild these buildings and we want to save the archives. At the same time, we also have this very abstract um, idea of, uh, I don't know, creating reality or fake, and w we don't know about that, this irritation that we have in times of social media and so more. And we have uh, this discussion of inclusivity, which, which I think... Um, is also um, a question, who, who else and what else is there to be shared? So uh, these were a bit my uh, ideas and of course also very important, I think the role of digital tools and social media and digital medias, which um, also for Docomomo and I guess every group that is dealing with that, um, uh, really brings us in a different uh, situation on to ask ourselves um, how do we work and how do we archive and how do we select and share information in general and knowledge. Um, yeah, this just some s uh, statements and um, I would maybe like to open the floor because we, we are already a bit late and uh, let's first have the audience to ask us some questions. Please try not to be very long in your comments, but rather a st start a discussion by putting questions and um, come into a dialogue. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for the presentations. Um, I have perhaps more of a comment than a question to Daniel, as somebody who has uh, also done a major research exhibition about uh, women architects in Estonia. If you um, conceptualize this as an exhibition of women architects or a feminist exhibition, um, because um, I think it is very important, and you actually partly even answered that perhaps, that uh, by including a lot of women, we also use the occasion to rethink about the criteria 
uh, on the basis of which we are including them and to broaden them and to actually rethink about what is valuable uh, and if these women are being judged according to the very masculinist achievement uh, uh, criteria that are uh, um, like uh, normal in the architecture culture. And, and actually this comment also perhaps goes to, to Julia's presentation about all these, uh, so to say, impure um, examples of modernism, these uh, regional adaptations and, and uh, things like that. So I'm really happy if, uh, if we are also able to, to broaden um, uh, such um, criteria of, of value. <laughs> And I will continue for Julia also, because it is very interesting, uh, the, qu the question how you came to these uh, namings, like regional, because uh, the same situation was with Kaunas modernism that I re yesterday presented. We were also offered very many different um, interpretations just to avoid pure modernism. For example, regional modernisms. Then there was a suggestion, suggestion from outside that it could be indigenous modernism. Then it was somebody proposed the very blockbuster name Baltic Bauhaus, just to reuse the Bauhaus. So it is interesting how we are looking to conceptualize or to frame something which is not in the very well-known centers of modernism. But uh, do we need it? It's, uh, it's, uh, or why are we starting automatically search for something other? Or I wouldn't say mediocre, but, <laughs> but uh, different modernisms. It is, it is really interesting. So I would like uh, to hear your, your answer, how you, you were searching for those names. One, one, one short comment for, for the first question. Thank you very much. I was uh, in the audience uh, at a discussion a couple of years ago when uh, a Hungarian woman architect who is quite well known talked about how uh, she is now, she's now in her 60s and she likes to do smaller projects all the time, smaller and smaller. She, she was at, at a point in her career when she designed the Palace of Arts in Budapest but now she enjoys designing a room. And I was like, wow. I mean, I, mean, I always imagine the architects are aiming for the bigger, and they are like, like constantly going forward and growing, and now, and, 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 not, and it's not. She proved me that it's different to think the other way, and that helped me a lot, actually, to, to, to put this in a new, uh, to try to put this in a new framework. And just a quick comment uh, to, the, to the other one. Yesterday, as I was listening to, to Professor Moravansky's lecture, which was amazing, by the way, as usual, uh, I just uh, thought that all this discussion about Central Europe and Eastern Europe and whatnot, what if we talk it about, uh, about it as if it was Europe? You know, <laughs> I mean, if Pevsner had the courage to call Western European architecture European architecture, because he did that in his book, then why don't we call ours European architecture, and I know it's, it, this is just like a brave statement, it's not necessarily something we could, we could do, but I suggest to, to keep this in mind, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, we didn't do the Topomomo project by ourselves, we had a partner on the Czech side, which was the Technical University of Liberec. And as I said, we are not a uh, scientific research facility university. We did the practical part of this whole thing. Uh, so we went to all those places, we talked to all those owners, tenants, people that were engaged with those buildings, and we didn't have the approach of, the, the, the theoretical approach of finding out what modernism this might be, or if this is a different modernism, it kind of just happened while we did it. So we're finding all those places, we're talking about the people, and our um, idea was trying to show people what is modern about this um, by telling the story behind it. Because what is modern about those buildings isn't necessarily only the, the design or the architecture, but it's what happened behind this. Why was this person 
Like uh, I showed you the picture of the pasta factory next to the Haus Schmincke. They were so very, very modern because uh, they invented kind of or used as a first factory to put the noodles in cellophane. So people that are buying them can actually see the product. And then there is a sock factory. They invented like a new way of knitting uh, the sock. So it's faster and more effective and more efficient. So we're concentrating on getting people, maybe people that are not interested in architecture or don't know anything about it, we're trying to tell them, well, this is really modern because that guy who did this was playing crazy or really thinking big, so our approach is definitely not a very theoretical one, I have to admit that, but we're the practical side of the project. So it kind of happened by doing it. Me, yeah, just yeah, we, but but just just a short comment on that. Uh, I think uh, very um, both both of you very important two comments. Of course, what you brought in, Julia, was this idea of what is the modern movement. Now speaking also maybe with the Tokomomo glasses on. That is very much about innovation. I mean, social innovation, it might be technical innovation, um, um, societal um, innovation um, that, that is then represented maybe by architecture. And on the scale, um, I mean, we are talking about architecture, but uh, there was this fantastic exhibition also last uh, fall on Retrotropria, which actually also showed the, the role of design and then I must say also interior design. and. Um, I mean, speaking as somebody who's teaching interior designers, this is very often an approach that starts with the small and with the human and with the space around and not with the getting bigger. So that is also uh, something which I think was very often incorporated in, in the modern movement because it was this holistic approach about it. And it's good to discover that um, again. But sorry, this was just a short comment. And um, My question will be also very short. I'm also asking you, know, you about the criteria of selecting uh, these modern buildings because you know, just I'm looking at the territory you are kind of uh, circumscribing, then I'm thinking of, of course, Konrad Wachsmann, whose buildings are probably not looking as radically modern, but the mass production of housing and so on is, is of course, a, a, a very kind of modern idea. And maybe if from, from this perspective, uh, these buildings are, are, are even more important and they are also appreciated, protected. There is a museum inside and so on. And the other, uh, speaking about Liberets, yesterday, uh, I think uh, the CL group, uh, so the, 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 this kind of uh, technical utopia after the war with Hubacek, Masak, and so on, were also very, very important. But uh, is it outside of the time frame, or, or how, would you, uh, how would you react to that question? Um, yeah, uh, first thing, a great example, the Konrad Wachsmann Haus in Niski, <laughs> it's in the first Topomomo book, so we didn't feature it again. Uh -huh. So um, we started with a, we actually have a very strict time frame from 1919 to 1945, buildings that were erected in that time. And uh, so we stuck to that and we started to collect buildings. And then we started to narrow it down and narrow it down again with different criteria. So first criteria was time frame because you need to put some, you need some frame to begin with. And we started with over 500 buildings and we just cut them down to the 30 that we found. And we had different um, criteria with each step of narrowing it down. And uh, as we are looking for the potential of those places uh, and uh, the network quality, for example, we were looking for places where we would find somebody who's already engaged and trying to do something. Then there's places that are not fully developed for example, they are in some kind of need of uh, support. Um, then, of course, there was a question, because we are trying to address everybody, like people that, are, that don't care about architecture, as I said earlier. Um, so it needs to kind of pop into your eye, OK, this is something different than my house. So there was a lot of criteria, and it, uh, we had different um, matrices that went down with every step.
Thank you. Thank you all for a wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to touch a topic that was actually in the air yesterday uh, already, and it is the, the role of activism and researchers and, uh, and what is after activism, actually, because uh, we, ha we knew the strategies, we, we should research, we should uh, make the public in to be interested in those uh, buildings and this heritage, but uh, uh, what role plays, for example, um, uh, ownership of the buildings, because we have the experiences, okay, we succeeded to list it, that buildings are listed, but Anyway, they disappear. So I would like to know what are the strategies or what are your experiences in that field? I'm, I'm talking particularly, uh, I would like to hear the answer from, from Alex or from Julia or from, from Daniel as well, because I know that you are all fighting with this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, well, there are, uh, there are plenty of uh, important uh, things uh, which maybe not are so visualized from the beginning. For example, uh, in the case of UFO building, it was kind of uh, education, uh, education uh, of society uh, with uh, urban architectural histories that uh, people uh, are living in the city and no, don't know any uh, information about uh, buildings and streets that shape them. For example, below uh, this UF4 shape, there is uh, a public transport uh, stop, and people are standing there constantly during the whole days and don't know what was happening there. And then another thing uh, is that uh, the case of um, uh, uh, flowers of Ukraine, it brings this uh, topic of copyrights of uh, architects from the Soviet and post-Soviet era. Because unfortunately, uh, this is my statement, uh, that Ukrainian architecture and architects uh, disrespect itself as a community. And uh, there are a lot of questions uh, in a way of laws, uh, restrictions, rules that are still stuck in a Soviet or post-Soviet uh, time and that are not somehow negotiating with the recent days. And unfortunately, all authorities are not also able or willing to shift, uh, to push uh, this action to go further uh, in the future and bring some changes. So these cases like Flowers of Ukraine, they uh, visualize, they bring these ideas, these this, uh, problematics on the table. And after that, even all these authorities, they're starting to do something with that. For example, these copyright rules in the, in the court started to be discussed. And a lot of other architects, also from the Union of Architects, started to uh, have a conversation and meeting in the architectural union on this topic, how we should deal with it. Because unfortunately, after the fall of the Soviet Union, also it was the fall of this uh, scientific project institutions. And nobody cares what will happen with archive and also copyrights. And all these institutions also are uh, or abandoned, or are in the private privacy of uh, of some also developers or big businessmen. So uh, I think that all these cases of activism they are great example of um, a civil society and a civil community. Very true examples, not on the paper, but in the real life. Luis, you also want, wanted to answer, I saw. I'm I, I don't have maybe. a good answer to that question. <clears throat> I just can give one or two examples. Last year I was on a conference about East German photography from the German Society of Photography, which is quite something, and everyone, uh, of course, complained how difficult it is, even if you are in your 80s and you're a very famous German photographer, that... Um, yeah, you have to work hard and pay some one or two people to um, make your archive fit to give it to a museum, but the museum doesn't pay you anything. You have to be happy if a German museum takes your 
uh, Nachlass, your heritage. Uh, and yeah, you don't get money for that. And you have to be happy and very famous if you even find a place in institution because photography in Germany and uh, postcards archive is really something far behind. <laughs> um, it's, it's not a good friendship. <laughs> And we need a concept, we need ideas, and we need to change the mindset so that there's more people, like person, more manpower, uh, to, to just do the daily work in the archive. Uh, we have to maybe build new houses that can house archives. And we have to, um, yeah, uh, give them more importance. That's what I can say. Any further comments from, no, from the, then, yeah, then please. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for uh, the wonderful presentations, for all of you. And I have uh, two, three questions concerning shared heritage. Um, one to, uh, to Julia. Uh, you uh, showed two maps, one of the trapezoid, uh, of the influences from Weimar, Dessau, Prague, and Wroclaw. And um, it is the, the, the Topo Momo project is a collaboration between the Czech Republic and Saxony, as I could see on the, on the uh, table. But you showed only examples from Germany and from the Czech Republic. What about Silesia and um, Poland? It's one cultural region in a way with all these modern achievements in Wroclaw and Waldbridge uh, and in, in all these cities. From my point of view, this belongs to this region. This is one question uh, for you. And for um, Alex, two questions. Wonderful. I, I, I wished I could see so many people marching to protect buildings here in Germany on the street. So this activity is, yeah, fantastic. But um, when I see that is also about Soviet heritage, and we all know that the Russian side instrumentalizing Soviet history for their imperialist purposes. How do you can motivate people to engage for Soviet heritage under these circumstances? Last small question. What about the situation of the uh, uh, flowers of Ukraine building today? Demolition started. And what's the situation now? Thank you. Um, yeah, very good question. Thank you very much. The problem is those were always projects with two countries involved. And that feels really bad when you're sitting in a border triangle of three countries. But uh, it, during this um, grant period that's uh, actually going on now, we're hoping to start um, a, a German-Polish project, maybe next, no, 20 five in 25 so we want to do the german polish um project and then for the future this could be a bigger funding in uh there's like interreg a is two countries interreg b is three countries or more so we're hoping on going three countries with uh three different languages which is gonna be tough in the future it i really know that uh the polish side is missing there it's just a question of time Thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, yeah, it's very important and interesting questions. So I will start from the end. Uh, these days, the Flowers of Ukraine, uh, its activist group, are very active uh, also in the field of the charity projects uh, within uh, full-scale invasion. And for example, one of the leader, Uliana Dzurlak, she is one of the most active uh, people which I know in these projects. And also the courts uh, are still ongoing. So, uh, for example, last uh, deal with one of the activist member, Taras, was during the uh, previous week. Unfortunately, uh, these uh, developers also, they have uh, roots, uh, business roots from Russia. Uh, but they have uh, a lot of money. Uh, as far as I know, the main uh, budget was about 12 uh, million uh, dollars. 
So they bought uh, this plot for uh, $4 million, and now they're spending the uh, rest of the money, which should be uh, part of this business project of this building development, but it stopped because of uh, activists, and they now are spending this money on uh, lawyers and advocates. But they have uh, good ones. I need to say, but on the other hand, a lot of people, what is m very important in this activism in Kyiv, and also important in a way of education, because a lot of people from other part of society are willing to be involved in these processes. So also one uh, uh, of the activist members of the Flowers of Ukraine are very famous advocates as well. And they are helping uh, Kvity uh, of Ukra uh, Ukrainians in Ukraine and uh, Flowers of Ukraine to advocate uh, activists. And also you can donate partly for some other uh, needs uh, for this activism to, I don't know, to help with some designer, etc. But advocates from the side of the Flowers of Ukraine are uh, participating for free and the members of their office are constantly visiting courts, etc. So it's an ongoing story. But there are a lot of also positive moments in this court side, which are positive on the side of the flowers of Ukraine. And about Soviet heritage, it's very difficult, very complicated uh, question in generally. But the cases of uh, flowers of Ukraine, uh, shows us uh, some also important points. The first one is that uh, the beginners of this activist group are uh, uh, members, or not members, are young generation people. Yes, so it's also again uh, about disrespect of uh, architects, of Ukrainian architects, which should be these people who will advocate and protect their own builders, but they just. Uh, don't want to do anything about this and just uh, forget that it was their projects also, not particularly these architects, but others. And also one of the main uh, manifests of Flowers of Ukraine is to uh, make this architectural Soviet heritage personal, that there was no just a huge scientific institution, that it was made, each project was made by a particular architect and also to make this uh, heritage Ukrainian, not Soviet, because Soviet also meant a lot of times before and now after the full invasion, like Soviet equals Russian, but it's not true. So to make the Soviet heritage Ukrainian, uh, Soviet heritage, and also personalized architecture and to find some ensembles of Ukrainian uh, heritage in this architecture. Thank you, Alex. And I think Marcin uh, wants to add here. If I come back uh, to the previous question about conservation of the material paths of the modernism, uh, I observe in many examples of contemporary artists, as I said, uh, tendencies to, um, to, to reworking this tradition, to, to build reference to modernism as not as a uh, material, material fact, but as a, a symbolic field, as a, a kind of idea. And I think that uh, it is idea which realizes in different levels on individual memory, social memory, and future projects and 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 means and means that uh, modernism as a lively tradition is uh, interpreted as a kind of freedom as a kind of emancipation as a kind of transcendent of presence and uh, presence and and i think that that uh, this conservation may be broadened to non-material in, into a symbolic level definition. So it is uh, my addiction. Yeah, thank you. Um, further comments here? Or do we have more comments, questions in the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel, please. <laughs> 
Just one last comment, because because the last questions were about shared heritage, which is a, the, the topic of, of this, this panel. And for me, it was quite spectacular that these seemingly very different lectures, uh, they highlighted this, this issue, because what is the shared heritage based on? It's based on, I guess, on our shared identity. And how do we build up identity, either common or personal identities? These are built on our upbringing, our personal histories, our education, and our media consumption, basically. And we have seen in a, in a few lectures that by using media in a smart way, we can inf reinforce identities and we can bring in topics that are seemingly forgotten or, or not known about and make them part of, of the identity of a new generation which didn't know about that. And in some other lectures, we have seen that if we use the tools the right way, then we are able to rephrase or, 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 or reinterpret this heritage that we had and make it more available for the new generations, for contemporaries. And I think that was quite interesting today in, in, in the lectures. If I may, for Daniel. Um, I'm just curious uh, if we put this uh, um, project into the context of previously held uh, um, researches on women designers or women artists uh, started from the beginning of the 70s with big questions why there have been no great women artists by Linda Nochlin and Griselda Pollock. Could you just briefly, if it's possible, tell us, uh, are you aiming to construct kind of a narrative in a historiographic way. So um, history of women architecture as a discourse in the something that is specifically Hungarian cultural history, particularly if there, some of these or most of them have been uh, doing in collaborative practices with their partners or being parts of teams and so on. So. Are you trying to put into the forefront their personal, individual parts in the, so to say, women history or of architecture or something else? Thank you. Uh, and I'm trying to do everything. <laughs> I'm also a hoarder, so I collect <laughs> archives <laughs> for the museum. Yeah, this is a problem. Uh, and I, I haven't actually decided. It's, it's a very good question. I think what, what we are trying to do with this, with this project is we are trying to make it possible to rewrite the, the past 100 years of Hungarian architectural history to be more inclusive. Because in, uh, usually Hungarian architectural history books include uh, built works by awarded architects. <laughs> in short, that's Hungarian architectural history. And we could expand this field like way before of, of what it is today to include others that, for example, haven't been awarded but have interesting and, 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 and amazing works. Or this field to, be, to, to, to include others who worked in the field of research, education, and so on. So, of course, now at the focus point of this research are women, but I think this will give us tools to build up a, a way more inclusive architectural history. And if, if I have to name one goal, then that's what we would like to do, is that to, to make everyone like, obvious that, uh, that, that these people are here and to make people able to, again, I have to use this, to reframe their understanding of, of architecture. And um, yeah, maybe just a short addition to that, C coming back to my conference yesterday on facades, which um, was also interesting. So a colleague of ours, Andreas Putz from TU Munich, uh, was presenting his research on uh, the um, on facade profiles and windows and facade. And, and he brought up an interesting point. I mean, as academics, we, we often look to, um, um, to history or history of architecture, interior architecture design from this biographical point of view or from an 
aesthetic point of view or a theoretical point of view. And uh, if we look into um, architecture, is also what is built and how it is built. So that means it's the the point of what who are the producers, who are what are the economic. Um, I mean the 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 society of um, construction history, for example, they often look into also these contexts. How are economical factors influencing that? That was also very present, I think, in Julia's uh, presentation on the region and, and who were the builders and what is the background of that. And, uh, um, and that may, may lead to completely other um, views on, on it. And it might also give us insight uh, to today just to make this, this bridge um, on, on how could we really, and that, that was also Henrietta's uh, question, I think, a little bit. I mean, what do we do with that? Um, and how can we turn it into something that also, I think, serves us today? I mean, of course, it's about the knowing, learning and knowing the history and, and discover it. But we have so many challenges today. If we think back, um, again, 100 years and the beginning of modernism, of modern movement, this was very challenging. There was a World War I, um, there was a lot of destruction, there was economic crisis, and um, I mean, today we are facing, again, we, we're facing a housing shortage in nearly every European, probably um, many countries of the world. Um, we are facing a lot of destruction. On the, on the other hand, um, um, not just of buildings, of, of people, um, hard economic, um, I don't know, disbalances um, of, of capital that is concentrated in private property or in big companies. So um, I think this, um, well, we cannot solve it today and not in this session, but, um, but um, um, we, we always should think about also, we are doing that and um, I'm always looking forward to um, how can it help us also to contribute and to, I don't know, make a little shift also in, in our today's uh, world somehow. Okay, this is, um, I think we, we are a bit uh, ahead of time. Um, uh, if there are no more questions, I think it, it would be nice to close the session to have some more time um, during the lunch break before to continue. Thank you to all the presentations and all the speakers. Thank you also for the questions. Thank you. Thank you.